Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Vine Church. You stand up and worship with us this morning.
shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Amen. You guys continue to worship with us.
morning, everybody. You can take a seat real quick. My name's David. I am the worship leader here at The Vine, and we're so happy to see you guys this morning. If it's your first time this morning, we would love to see you guys over in the garden. It's in that back corner over there. And we'd love to uh, give you a gift just for showing up today. We're not going to be weird. We're not going to show up at your house or be calling your phone every five seconds. But um, we'd just really like to get to know you. So if you'll show up over there at the garden, um, we just want to tell you that we're really happy that you're here and give you a, a small gift. Um, Next thing I'm going to talk about really quick is our Thursday night greenhouse gatherings. Um, We are all about community here. And I mean, I don't know if you, I mean, you see these other guys and and lady, my wife up here with me. Um, And the band, we have a, we have a really great community where we get together at least once a week and and we get to rehearse together, but we have a great time while we do it. So that's a really great community. But a way that you can be involved in your, in our community here is these Thursday night greenhouse gatherings. We meet at 625 at Tyler's house on Thursdays. And right now we're doing Financial Peace University with that. Um, If you have ever struggled with money, which who in here has ever struggled with money? I'm going to put both hands up because I know I have. Um, this is a great way uh, to learn better, uh, be- how to better steward the money that God has given you. A lot of people feel that you don't have enough money to be able to tithe, you know, give back to the church or, or give back to charities or anything like that. But honestly, you can't afford to not give back to God. Uh, from what I have learned through um, stewarding faithfully of, for the, with the money and me and my wife budgeting our money uh, faithfully, um, it is just something that you can't not do. You really need to do it. So if you're interested um, just to learn how to, how to save more money and everything, please, please check that out. Um, so that leads into my next thing, giving. Um, here at The Vine, we don't have a specific percentage or anything that we want you to give. We want you to give what, what you feel led to give. Um, but like I said before, you can't outgive God, and you really need to, uh, to think about that. But we'd ha- be happy to talk to you about that, to give you some more advice about that and all that. And I, I personally would, be, would love to... Uh, talk to you about that if you'd like. Um, The next thing uh, we're going to be doing uh, next week, which I'm really excited about, is our Heart for the House giving. We're going to be giving to the Carolina Pregnancy Center next week. And um, if you don't know anything about the Carolina Pregnancy Center, they have like parenting classes for for, um, parent, uh, you know, soon-to-be parents and and mothers. They do uh, post-abortion trauma therapy for, for mothers and stuff like that. It's just a wonderful, wonderful service, and we're really happy to be um, given given to them. So on on Sunday next week, uh, we're going to give that um, offering, or we're going to give that offering here at the church. And then on Mother's Day, we're actually going to present that to the Carolina Pregnancy Center. So we're really uh, looking forward to that. So be praying, be thinking about what God's leading you to give um, for that. Um, lastly, uh, we are going to get into our next uh, worship song, and this song is uh, called "Give Me Faith," and. I know a lot of times we we take faith for granted, um, or we just completely forget about God throughout our week. I mean, if you think about it, how often do you really think about it throughout the week, unless you were purposefully, intentionally spending time with him every morning? Um, But in this song, we are asking God to give us faith, give us faith and trust what he tells us to do. So you guys stand up and worship with me, and I'm going to pray, and and we're going to worship the song. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house and to stand in your presence. God, we pray that you can give us faith, light a fire in our souls for you. God, I pray that this softens our hearts and that we can hear the words that are about to be preached this morning. God, we love you.
Soften our hearts so we can be 
broken. God, break our pride. Because we are nothing without you. We cannot stand without you, God. Lord, give Tyler the words to say this morning. Speak through him. You know how we go. You got to high five three people and let them know why you're thankful they're here today. Crowd participation. A few slaps. They're nice church slaps. I see them. They're great. They're nice church slaps. They're nice and easy. Nice and easy. Hey, haven't we all been there where we've asked that question, where we say, I want to believe, but. I'm so excited as we go through these next few weeks and, and, and walk through this series. But the thing that I'm really excited about that I have to take a moment of pause to say is this. I'm thankful for each and every one of you as I've got to walk through this surgery this past few weeks. I'm thankful for the incredible word Alex brought last week as we celebrated Easter number two at the Vine, guys. Like, I don't know, it's crazy uh, that we get to be a part of Easter. Like, I'm telling you, like two years ago, we would have never thought, actually three years ago, uh, two years ago, basically, we were uh, preaching a different Easter series at a different uh, church filling in while their pastor was out. So uh, it was crazy. So Alex got to do that again while I was uh, trying to recover from surgery. So I'm thankful for that. So if you see me sit down in the stool, we might just be getting real for a minute. It's going to be all right. So if I have to take a break there, it's going to be awesome. But one thing that Jesus has been teaching me through this is many things. Uh, but he's not done with me yet. So y'all got to put up with me a little bit longer. So just to let you know. So whatever season you're walking through, if there's breath in your lungs. If you've got eyes to see, ears to hear today, I want you to know he is not done with you yet. Because here's the thing, whether we follow Jesus for 20 years or we're not quite sure who he is as we tune in today, we've all asked that question. We've literally asked this question, and we've literally sent that text, and there's someone in our life that we've said that to, because here's the thing, it's often really, really hard in our life to believe a God we can't see, isn't it? Like sometimes he doesn't answer our prayers, and we get upset, and we say, I want to believe, but God's not answering my prayer. Maybe we've been praying for something for a long time, and we just haven't seen it come to pass, and we've had those doubts, or, or maybe we've, we've lost a family member, or we've walked through a sickness, or we're trying to figure out why God is allowing suffering in our life, and maybe we just wonder if we feel like we're all alone. Uh, and that's what this series is about. That's what we're going to walk through over these next few weeks, is that right there. Uh, we're going to be walking through... <laughs> Uh, I want to believe what? By the way, God bless you. Uh, we're, we're walking through, I want to believe, but, because I believe there's good news in this. Because the thing that I love about, the thing I love about following Jesus is you're never walking through things alone. You're in good company. So if you've ever felt guilty or shameful that you've asked this, and you say, I can't go to church today because I don't believe, I want to tell you, we've all been there. So you're in good company. Whether you're watching online in the middle of the week, or you're hanging out with us in the house today, I want you to know you're in great company uh, as we get to do that. So today, if I could title this talk, if I could title this dialogue, if I could title this, this time we get to spend together anything, I will be talking about this thing called, I want to believe, but, and it's going to be titled, Stand Out. Stand out. So if you're taking notes today, that's where we're going to be. Stand out is the name of the message. Because if there's anything you know about Tyler West, he stands out like a sore thumb. That's just how I roll. So uh, that being said, I'm excited about this message and kicking off this new series because of that. So if you've got your Bible today, we're going to camp out in 1 Peter 13 mostly. And then we're going to camp out in Acts 2 for just a minute. But here's the thing. If you want a free Bible, we have them in the garden. 
guys, there, it's yours for the taking. So if you're watching online and you'd like one, we'd love to send you one. But if you're like a lot of people and you do things digitally, we also each and every week partner with a Bible app. And we have all of the scripture available for you to follow along there. So I want to show you how to do that really quickly. Uh, if you'll, you'll download the Bible app from your favorite app store, whatever that might be. Go ahead and click on it. Click on the More tab. Uh, and once you do that, you're going to be able to click on events. Once you click on events, you're going to see the Vine TV worship experience. Today, you're going to see I Want to Believe But stand out. Uh, and you're going to see the scripture that follow along with. But more importantly, you're going to find a place to connect with us throughout the week. Like we talked about, we live a life of connection. David was talking about that earlier. We live a life of connection here at the Vine. We believe connected together is where we can see life change happen best because we're in Christian community here. So there's ways that you can reach out to us if we can serve you or specifically pray for you in any way. And also just a place where you can take notes. So we're going to dive into this thing called standout. So how many people, I'm going to date myself not literally, but say how old I am. Uh, I'm going to date myself in this one. How many of us remember that magazine Finger Hut? Did anybody remember getting that in the mail? Didn't they have some wonky stuff in there? For some reason, I always equate Finger Hut with garden gnomes. I don't know why, but I think of garden gnomes. Like they had pages and pages of garden gnomes. And so I was like, man, I got to talk about that today. But maybe you're not in the Finger Hut game. Maybe that's the Finger... I don't even know if they have a website. Don't type that in. That's probably not a good thing. But... Finger Hut, if you're not in the Finger Hut magazine, maybe you've watched Shark Tank. How many folks have ever watched the show Shark Tank? A few. Okay, we had more people who know about Finger Hut. These are my people. I love this. But Shark Tank, have you ever watched that show? And basically, if you haven't, it's where folks present ideas and, and they try to get people to invest in their business. But have you ever just been watching that show and said, oh my goodness, what are you wasting your time for? Like, who in the world would buy that? Like, sometimes, like, like something like a cozy for your Q-tips, like, or something like that, you know, some kind of crazy concept, you know, that people have. I remember one time I was watching, and, and the guy who invented Ring came on, and all the sharks denied him, told him it would never take off, and I think pretty much everyone has that at this moment in time, or cameras at some point in their house, but all of us can watch that show and say, who in the world would buy that? There's usually one or two of them that just look crazy, and we say that, and it started making me think about the church. It started making me think about people who don't go to church or people who are outside the church. You know, when, when, when we get together on Sundays, we have breakfast right before we get to hang out here at worship, which is great. And a lot of folks who don't go to church may stand outside and say, I see those people eating together. They say, I love you. They walk with each other through every season. Uh, and, and that just seems weird. But one of the weirdest things I think we walk through in church world that feels a little bit like the shark tank is imagine this. How many folks have a swimming pool at home? Hands everywhere. Uh, a swimming pool at home. Imagine you open your swimming pool every spring. You have a live team, a live band behind you. They're singing, there's a crowd, there's clapping, and you are WWE style choke slamming people in it. And people are losing their mind, dry clothes and all, hugging people who are wet in their clothes, going nuts. And it just looks like something crazy is happening, right? Well, I want you to take a step outside of the church for a minute, and I want you to know that's how folks outside the church feel about baptism. They would ask that question, like, who does that? Who gets in a pool with their clothes on and lets somebody just drop them down after they say Jesus Christ? And everybody's cheering and applauding and going nuts. Like, why would you not just take a shower? Like, what in the world is, why would you put yourself through that torture? And so when I was thinking about this message and how God was preparing me for that, I thought about, man, sometimes folks think the church is like Shark Tank and step outside and look in and say, why do they stand out like that? Like, who does this thing called baptism? How weird is it? Not only is baptism weird, if you've been at church, you can't even, we can't even agree on how to do it. Like, no matter where you've been at church, a lot of times uh, you've heard different types of baptism. Maybe you've heard of this thing called a fusion. <laughs> a fusion is the name of it. Okay, a fusion is literally where you pour water over someone's head. I don't know if you've been a part of that, but someone gets, gets the water, they, they fill the, the water in the basin and, the, and they pour it over their head. Or maybe you've heard of this thing called aspersion. 
aspersion. That's where someone is sprinkled instead of being baptized. So a lot of folks, I'm seeing some head nods, so they know about that. So you've heard of a fusion or maybe just pour over to what it's been called. Aspersion is another way where somebody sprinkles it over you. Or you've heard of and seen what we believe in here at the Vine is immersion. Those are some big words, right? Some big S-I-O-N words. Immersion, where you're fully brought under the water and brought back up. And so what we believe in is immersion here, and a lot of us could equate it with that guy called John the Baptist, right? Like we've heard of him, right? Like that's where we have that. So a lot of times when we go there, quick mic change. All right, there we go. Quick mic change. There we go. You like that. I saw that. That that woke everyone up. I'm standing out with that. So immersion. And so when I think of someone outside the church, they see we can't agree on baptism. They see we can't agree on it. And they say, man, they're into WrestleMania or something because they choke slam everybody and they go under the water. So who in the world does that? So the thing that I want to help you with today is I want to unpack this thing called baptism. Because for 2,000 years, that's what's been happening. Remember, Jesus got baptized, and then he started his ministry. But also, when he left us, a lot of times you refer to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where he talks about going into all the nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always until the end of the age. So today, I want us to have an outsider perspective. I want you to take everything you know about baptism Get a big giant white out and just white it out. Think of that finger hut. They probably had some kind of magic eraser or something in there that made it just white everything out. Just white out everything you know about baptism. And let's start with a clean slate because I'm willing to bet today your perception is going to be changed. I want you to look at it like an outsider looking in because a lot of times when we're doing this, folks outside the church are like, Y'all are a bunch of crazy people. Like, I don't know. And they're right. We are pretty crazy. If you're, uh, this church is crazy because I'm here. I'm just going to let you know. However, outside looking in, you would see that the church stands out and you would wonder whether you want to be a part of it or not. And today I want to invite you to come be a part of it and come be a part of what Jesus is doing because maybe your perception is completely wrong. So today we're going to talk through that as we talk about standing out and this thing called stand out so i want to talk to you about some notable baptisms you may or may not know about so one that we've mostly heard of is the acts 2 baptism right like most of us have heard about that that's where three thousand men were baptized in one day right like we know about that but let me share you some more with you in 404 a.d john christensen baptized three thousand roman soldiers at constantinople that's a pretty notable baptism that's a lot of people at once right like we've seen that Then this guy in 430 A.D. named Patrick of Ireland, the guy we just celebrated, St. Patrick, right? We just celebrated him last month. He baptized the king of Ireland, his son, and 11,000 men in the same day. Pretty crazy, right? King, his son, 11,000 men in one day. Then in 597 A.D., this guy named Augustine baptized 10,000 men in one day. That's He had a sore arm after that, didn't he? But what he did is he not only baptized 10,000 men, they in turn, the men in turn, baptized their wives and all of their children in the same day. That's a big deal, right? That's a lot of baptism. But the one that sticks out the most to me when they go in the history over this past 2,000 years with baptism is this guy named Boniface. You can look him up. His name, uh, he's a German missionary. You can type him up, look him up, Google it sometime. It's B-O-N-I-F-A-C-E, just like it sounds, Boniface. And from 680 to 755 A.D., that's 75 years, this German missionary is said to have baptized over 100,000 people in Germany. Can you believe that? 100,000 people. So the thing is, even though we can't agree on baptism, wouldn't you say that's pretty encouraging and yet still perplexing? 100,000 people? You know what I didn't tell you about is how they did it. Did he go by aspersion, effusion, or immersion? What did it look like? What was he going? 100,000 people in a day, and it started making me think, how about you? Do you remember your first baptism? I'm going to tell you, I don't. I was a baby. That was my dedication. And I was baptized. 
Many of us have that story at a baby dedication where we were sprinkled and baptized and we were probably really angry if the water was cold, cried very loudly. I remember, I don't remember my baptism, but I remember people talking about it and I remember seeing the pictures, but I don't remember my first baptism, but I can remember when I was truly baptized after I met Jesus as my Lord and Savior as a child. And I remember walking through that baptism and how it stood out to me. But my question is, how about you? If somebody asked you about your baptism, would you be able to tell them what that meant in your life? Would you be able to show them what it means? Because the thing is, we get so caught up in the act of how we do it that we've forgotten what it truly means. As a matter of fact, we may not even know what it truly means. So today, let's unpack what this thing called baptism is. So if you've got your Bible today, let's head into 1 Peter 13. And we're going to show you some new things. And if we had a concentration on today, pay particular attention to verses 20 and 21, because that's where we're going to focus most of our time talking about this thing called baptism today. But just a little backstory, Peter is talking right here in this letter to folks who just asked this question and had just te- sent that text. I want to believe, but we're going through it. They're going through a hard time and they're trying to believe in God. And so this is Peter's response to that. And he says, who is going to harm you? If you are eager to do good, don't we get stuck in that sometimes, right? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. This is one of my favorite things, and I know I've got some great things that are about to happen. If you've ever uh, been to an apologetics class or know something that's going on, this is one of the, the great verses for that. And it says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. And if you got your Bible, highlight this next part, circle this part. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you and your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Hard to believe that sometimes, isn't it? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went into the proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Don't get caught up in that. I know that can be crazy. Don't get caught up in the imprisoned spirits part. We can save that for another day. We'll dive into that as, as he went through that. <clears throat> excuse me, and prison spirits to those who were disobedient long ago with God. Now, if you got your Bible, this is where I really want us to hone in on what we're going to talk about today. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, this is going to make sense here in a minute. We're talking about Noah and the ark. This is crazy what Peter says here. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And what does it say? And this water symbolizes what? baptism that now saves you also not the removal of dirt from the body but the pledge of a what a clear conscience towards God it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels authorities and powers in submission to him so you're saying that was a lot of gobbledygook for a moment and you got the two verses And I see you're saying baptism, but why the heck is Noah in there? What is going on? Well, that's what I want to unpack today is this thing called baptism. And I want to share with you three things about baptism that Peter is trying to tell us and that we can see in God's word. And it may give you a clearer picture of what your baptism meant because I'm willing to bet some of us today... Maybe we're baptized in our past and we don't know why. Maybe some of us today have have been saved by the grace of God and have given our life to Jesus, but we haven't been baptized yet and we need to figure out what that looks like for each of us. Or maybe some of us just got baptized because somebody told us we had to and never really understood it. Well, today I want to set you free from that and I want you to be able to know why you should be baptized. So number one, if you're taking notes, it's going to be a little bit of a teaching day, so hang in here with me. Number one, if you're taking notes, Baptism relates to the past. Baptism relates to the past. You see, what what Peter said here is, if you remember, it says the flood of Noah, only eight were saved. Anybody remember that that story about the ark where Noah and the ark was built? And what happened is God created the earth and the the people of the earth grew wicked. And God said, I'm going to destroy it all because I can't find a righteous man on earth. And all of a sudden, he saw Noah and his family. 
And he tells Noah to pack up seven of every clean. A lot of times if you've got Bible trivia, you're welcome or you're watching Jeopardy, a seven of every clean. A lot of times you aren't taught that. Seven of every clean, two of every unclean animal he throws on the ark. And they go, and Noah's on the arky, arky. Anyway, we'll get that day, right? Like you got to go, you know that's BBS. If you know, you know. So uh, Noah has this flood, and this flood happens on earth, which, by the way, every major religion in the world talks about a flood in past times. I don't know if you know that or not. But every major religion describes that flood and has someone who survives it. So if you think you're not related to somebody, hmm, hate to tell you. Only eight were saved. So I'm just trying to tell you we all related by God's grace. Um, and what happens in this flood is God floods the entire earth. For 40 days and 40 nights it rains, similar to what's happening here in South Carolina it seems. And the ark goes and God lets the ark land and then they go repopulate the earth. But God saves Noah from certain destruction. And what I want to tell you about baptism is your baptism relates to the past. That's what Peter's trying to tell you is it points back to something. It relates back to your past in some way, shape, or form. See, what happened is when Noah got on that ark, he left his old life and stepped into his new life. That ark was his salvation. That ark was the thing that saved him from the wickedness and flood of the earth. And that's kind of where we can be. And, and where when we have a relationship with Jesus, that's exactly what happens is, if you ever remember in the temple, uh, what happened is when Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom and gave us, gave us access to the presence of God, which was found in the ark of the covenant, in the ark. So when we step into the presence of God through Jesus, we now all of a sudden leave our old life, step into our new life, and we're saved from the waters and death of sin and shame. That's exactly what happens. Our baptism points back to our old life, and that's what Peter is trying to tell us here, because this is literally what salvation is. When, when we give our life to Jesus, I'm about to explain this here in a moment, we are baptized. I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? You're thinking right now, maybe in your head, I'm baptized, so that means I need to either be fully immersed, somebody's got to sprinkle me, or they got to pour something over my head. But here's the second thing I want to show you about baptism. You see, baptism echoes a principle. Baptism echoes a principle. Because when I say baptism, I guarantee you, like I said, I told you to wipe the slate clean today, but even now it's hard to fight what you've been taught and what you've been shown is right now you probably had something religious happen right now, right? Like you thought of some religious, maybe it was your baptism, maybe it was a family member getting baptized. Something came in your mind about baptism, but let me tell you a little bit about this word called baptism. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo. Doesn't that sound great? Baptizo. Let me tell you what that means because this is what the translation is here in Greek. Baptizo means to immerse, to plunge, or to cleanse by dipping. Let me tell you what baptizo means. I know some folks right now went to go see this brand new movie, the blockbuster of the summer. You probably saw it in IMAX. I, I haven't seen it, don't worry. Uh, you probably saw it in an IMAX or a 3D theater. And what ended up happening is you are immersed in the movie by the sound. You're immersed by everything going on. You're literally baptizo in that experience. That's what baptism means. Baptizo, you're immersed. So in other words, when you go to the theater, you want to be really cool. I'm sure the popcorn is baptizo by the butter and whatever else you put in there. Like you're immersed in an experience. And the Greek word baptizo comes over here. And you may be saying, so how in the world did this creep over from the secular to the religious? Because I'm still not understanding. So immersed, does that mean that I have to be baptized by immersion, aspersion, or effusion? Like what are you trying to tell me? No, no, no. I'm telling you, when you literally give your life to Jesus, you are baptized you were immersed in him. We're going to unpack that. So here's what happened to the Jews that you may not know. Back in the time that Jesus was walking the earth, there were three things that had to happen for a Gentile to be converted to Judaism. That's me and you. We're not Jew. We're not part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, we, we, we would be considered Gentiles. So three things had to happen. Number one, you had to sit under the instruction of a scholar. Okay, we can check that off. So there was probably a priest or a scholar. You had someone who taught you something. And obviously it couldn't fall on deaf ears. Most of the time that was someone who had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Uh, and they were able to tell you about all these laws that you had to follow. The second thing is if you were a Jewish man, you had to be circumcised. More on that later. You had to be circumcised if you were a Jewish man. 
Number three, you had to be baptized. Say, time out. I haven't heard of baptism in the Old Testament. Well, see, to be converted, what ended up happening for a Jew to be a Gentile is he had to be ceremonially clean. And what would end up happening is you would be able to memorize the Torah, you would be circumcised to make a covenant with God, and you would be baptized, which means you washed away your pagan life, came up out of the water into new life, and that represented your new covenant with God. So this thing called baptism, we've probably only equated most of the time in church with a New Testament principle, right? We don't think that it's something old. As a matter of fact, how this would happen is outside the temple gates, if you remember in the New Testament, we could see Peter and John were baptizing people outside of the temple courts, and we probably thought that that happened by the Christians, that they were out there with, a, with their axes and their shovels digging these, these troughs of water, but believe it or not, that was a Jewish principle that happened. The men to enter the temple court, once again, had to be ceremonially clean, so once they went from being a Gentile to a Jew, or a Jew, that that was representing the new covenant of God. They could not walk into the temple court ceremonially unclean, which means maybe they touched a leper. Maybe, maybe they, they touched an animal or ate an animal they weren't supposed to. They couldn't enter the temple dirty. They had to be symbolized as righteousness. They had to be clean. So what would happen is the Jewish men, before they would enter into the temple courts, would go into these pools of water with steps in them, completely immerse their self, pop up out of the water, and then be able to go into the temple. Isn't that crazy? They immersed themselves in God's presence again. They had to be clean. And so for us, growing up in the church, when I was getting ready and studying for this, I had never really had this explained to me that even in Jewish principle, there was baptism. See, Paul even talks about this. If you ever want to go back and look at it in 1 Corinthians 2.10, he points it out. He says that Israel was baptized or immersed in Moses as God led them cloud by day, fire by night. They were immersed in his leadership. They were following him completely. They had given everything they had to go there. When we look at the cross, the crucifixion, literally Jesus is immersed in our sin and shame to set us free with salvation. And once again, like I said, salvation itself is a baptism because we are confessing leaving our old life behind and stepping into our new life and being immersed with Christ. That's why we say we'll follow you the rest of our life step by step. Which leads us to what we probably know and this cool guy named John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. Like most of us have heard about him, right? Like when we think of baptism, he is like the guy we point to. We know that, that he was a, an outdoorsman for sure, ate locusts, had a weird thing, prepared the way for Jesus to come. And so when we, we look at John the Baptist and we look at this thing called baptism, what happened was, I told you, you know, when you be converted from being a Gentile to a Jew, you had to be washed in the river first, in a river itself, okay? So you couldn't be dipped in that pool outside of the temple to convert first. You had to go to a river. Do you know why you had to go to a river? It's considered living water, living water because it's moving so john the baptist baptized in the jordan for a reason what was important is the reason he did that it was living water this is what i love about jesus he says when we follow him we'll have rivers of life flowing out of us moving active life moving active water something that's important right like when we have those things it's living so john the baptist would have been out there and he would be considered a scholar for people he would have been the one that they could sit under and gentiles could be baptized but here's where the ruckus came out for John the Baptist, he wasn't baptizing Gentiles. He was baptizing Jews. And while the leadership got angry, as they were saying, the Jewish leadership was like, hang on, time out, what's going on? Because if Jews are getting baptized, they're saying something's wrong. What would end up happening is John had the Jews come to him to the Jordan River, and they would say, listen, I'm an outsider. My religion isn't working. Something is wrong. I'm trying to be a good person. I've memorized the Bible. I'm trying to live this good life. I'm ceremonially clean, but I don't feel any more connected to God than I did before. There is something missing in me. I'm an outsider looking in. Right? Like, that's what the Jews were telling John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist says in Matthew 3, he said, when Jesus was coming, I baptized with the baptism of repentance. Baptism of repentance. 
So what's crazy is baptism can be repentance. You see, John the Baptist is saying, I'm an outsider looking in. These Jews are coming. And all of a sudden, we know in that same thing, Matthew 3 is normally where you go when you talk about baptism and Jesus being baptized. But we can miss that John the Baptist, the reason he was preparing the way, is he was preparing the way because the Jews first, to be converted, had to have baptism to symbolize their new covenant with God. But God knew there was still something missing. So they had to repent admit something was missing, that they were an outsider looking in. And to do that, they had to have a way to have a relationship with God. And so that's why John the Baptist says, hey, I baptize you with the baptism of repentance, but someone greater is coming. His name is Jesus, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. A new operating system, something new in us, something different. So once again, another baptism comes up, this word baptizo, which immerse. You will be immersed with the Holy Spirit. So to come to Jesus, to come and have a relationship with God, first you had to understand that you were separated from him and you needed to, you needed to be a part of his covenant that he loved you. In order to do that, you had to have repentance that wasn't new. That's where John the Baptist was repairing the way you had to have repentance. And then when you come to life in Christ, you get to receive the Holy Spirit. The same thing we celebrated last week that gives us the power over death that, that, that raised Jesus from the dead is filled inside of us, helps make us pure and holy, helps us to continue to be all that we were created to be. And so this thing called baptism isn't something that's an act. It's something that we continually live in, which leads to number three. Baptism reveals power. So baptism relates to the past, it echoes this principle that goes all the way back to, to, Jew, to, to Israel leaving Egypt and Judaism happening, and then John the Baptist comes, prepares away, and then Jesus comes, so it's not in your power that you're baptized. As a matter of fact, it's in the power of the Holy Spirit that we look at. Like I said, we just celebrated that last week. So what ended up happening, once again in this revealing power, as Noah, as Peter was saying, Noah in the ark, as Noah stepped onto that ark, gave his life fully to God and said, I'll go wherever you call me to go, Lord, like my old life is behind, I can't eat live it any longer I have to literally land where you want me to land and literally I'm in your arms God all of a sudden when we give our life to Jesus we get to have the power of the Holy Spirit with us but I love what happens here because another crazy thing about baptism got caught up in that Peter verse where we were talking about First Peter, when he said in 321, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. What I end up hearing a lot of times is we have to be baptized to be saved. And so I would tell you, yes, but not the way you think. Not the act of baptism that we equate in a religious practice, the baptism of being immersed fully with God in you. So you may say, well, well, what is it? Is it something I have to go into the water? Well, no, 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 no. It's faith. It's faith. When we have faith, that's when we say we're fully immersed. We're baptized in Christ. We're, we're fully immersed in him. We're no longer our old self. We've given our life fully to him, and we understand that his sacrifice on the cross is what it took for us to have a relationship with God, and, and that's where repentance comes in, and that's where this all lines up. And so it leads me to the question, do you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, you don't have to go through the principle of being baptized to be saved, but yes, you do. But here's the main thing. If you want to go through what we traditionally call baptism, where you're either aspersion, effusion, or immersion, you got to be saved first. Yes. So this baptism that you have can be something weird as you talk to. Because what ends up happening is when I say that all the time and say, do you have to go through this religious principle of sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, to be saved, what I always get thrown to me, and these people, uh, as they call them, uh, they're, they're called baptismal regenerist, if you're taking notes, baptismal regenerist, they always throw this verse at me, and it's this, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, and this is why most of us, when we were baptized and dedicated as a baby, got baptized as a baby, is this, Peter replied, Repent and what? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now people say, are you refuting God's word, Tyler? It clearly says right there, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And here's what I want to unpack for you. You got to go to the Greek. You got to go to the Greek here. Because the Greek word for four is E-I-S. You can look it up. E-I-S is the Greek word for four. And what it literally means is because of. Four points to something that happened before it. So four points to Jesus Christ in this example. And because of is what the Greek of F-O, our F-O-R is E-I-S in the Greek, which means because of. So I'm going to read this to you again as it was originally written by Peter. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins. Not in order to receive is what we believe for to be the Greek word is because of the forgiveness of your sins and once you have that then you can receive the Holy Spirit so so many times in my life I've I've heard that and I've heard well you got to be baptized to be saved well that's once again some misnomer we have when folks outside the church look at us and say those folks are crazy outside of just listening to, to anything we do because here's what I always push back on this before I even knew the Greek for this Can you be baptized in every circumstance? For instance, a few weeks ago we did seven cries from the cross and we talked about favor. Remember there were two criminals on the right and left and one said, remember me? And Jesus said, surely today you will be with me in paradise. If you had to be baptized to be saved and it wasn't about faith, Jesus would have said, man, you're all out of luck. (laughs) Can you not see I'm getting murdered on a cross here? Do you see a baptismal pool that I can fully immerse you, sprinkle you, or pour water over your head to get you saved? You can't be saved. You're out of luck. You're out of time. No longer can you be saved. He would have said that. That's not what he said. He says, surely today you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because of his faith and the forgiveness of sins. Paul writes as he goes throughout all the world teaching the great teacher he was and the great writer he was, as we read a lot of what he wrote in the New Testament, he said... Christ sent me to share the gospel, not to baptize you. To share the gospel, the hope of the gospel, to share Jesus, not to baptize you. So that's why Paul didn't go around being baptized and go around baptizing people, dunking them as we say, or choke slamming them WWE style, or sprinkling some water over them, or pouring water over their head. He didn't walk around doing that. He said, no, 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 I just want to share the hope of the gospel. And how did he do it? By his story of saying, this was my old self as Paul, where I breathed, or Saul, excuse me, where I breathed threats against the church. I wanted to murder anyone who said they loved Christ Jesus. And this is my new life and as Paul where I go around sharing how he blinded me on the way to Tarsus and then he showed me the way and he showed me that I was separated from him, that my religion was not good enough, that I could show up to church every Sunday, I could give till I couldn't see anymore and none of that mattered. What ended up mattering is faith that Jesus is who he says he is, that I had to repent for forgiveness of my sins and believe that he died on the cross and believe that he rose again on the third day. I had to do that and you can have that hope. And right now you can say, I want to believe, but I'm, I want to believe, but this baptism thing is weird. I don't want to get baptized. So that's why I don't want to give my life to Jesus. And I just want to stop you in your tracks today and say that has nothing to do with it. So you may ask me today, well, this is great. You've unpacked baptism and you've given me the great excuse why I don't need to be baptized. I'm so excited. Well, the question you are going to ask yourself right now is why should I get baptized? I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, number one, instruction. Why should I get baptized? Instruction. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, once again, Jesus said, Go into all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always until the end of the age. So Jesus not only commanded us to do it and instructed us to do it, Jesus also said, the world will know that you love me by how you keep my commands. So if Jesus said do it, don't you think it's a pretty good idea 
that you should do it? Once you give your life to Jesus, wouldn't you say that if Jesus took that step, that you would want to take that step? As a matter of fact, a lot of us, because we haven't truly understood baptism, we may be stuck in our walk with Jesus. We may have given our life to Christ, and we believe he is what he says he is, but we haven't received the gift of being all he created us to be and taking a next step because we've been stuck at this baptism thing. We can't get off of it. We try and we keep circling back around it time and time again, and we can't figure out why we're not growing in our walk. We can't figure out why nothing's making a difference, and it's because we've never truly been baptized because we don't understand what it means. We just had a pastor stand up there and tell me I had to get it done. But can you see what it represents? Which leads me to the second reason you should be baptized. Identification. Jesus instructed us and commanded us to be baptized if we want to follow him and and love him and show the world him. But number two, our identification. When we are baptized, we are literally identifying with Christ's burial and resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection. When When you hear this and it's ever been explained to you, the reason we do full immersion baptism is we say when you go under the water, that represents Christ's death and burial, your old life, And when you come out of the water, it represents his resurrection, your new life in him. That's why at the end of it, you always say, I I baptize you, my brother or sister, in the name of Jesus Christ. Buried in likeness of his death. Risen in likeness of his resurrection to what? Walk in newness of life. You're identifying, you're telling the world, you're making a proclamation. This inward change in me, I'm not afraid to put a Jesus jersey on. I'm not perfect, I don't have everything right, but everything I do in my life will point to him because I'm immersed by him. When I mess up, it will point to him. When I do right, it will point to him. Everything that I do because I'm immersed in Christ will point to him. So you're making it personal. I remember the first time I baptized as a pastor, uh, I was on staff at a church, and we were in this really cold swimming pool, for real. And there was an elementary school child. Uh, I got to, to lead him to Jesus at a class, and, and he knew baptism was his next step. And I'm telling you, the water was literally 50 degrees. I mean, it, it was freezing. So you imagine this fourth grader that I'm getting to baptize, and I literally, I remember holding him, and I'm like, all right, you ready? We're going to do this. We're excited. And his whole body is shaking like this. Like this is what the baptism looked like. His photos, you see his teeth chattering. And I remember looking at him and he was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get through it. And I remember asking him, who's your Lord and Savior? And so Jesus got a few extra syllables that day, but he was not afraid to say Jesus Christ. And I remember him going under and that kid couldn't run fast enough out of that pool when he was done because he was so cold. But it made me think about this. Even a fourth grader has the insight to understand that he had to make it personal and who he identified with and understood that it mattered because he knew that be exactly who Jesus created him to be he had to take that step so if you've never been baptized or truly understood what it mean I would ask you to take that step because as verse 21 says from first Peter 3 baptism gives us a good conscience towards God because we are saved by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was immersed in excuse me, <clears throat> Jesus was immersed in suffering on the cross so that we could be immersed in salvation. Jesus was immersed in pain and shame of our sin so that we could be immersed in peace. Jesus was immersed in death so that we could be immersed in life. Baptized. Baptized. So whether you're stuck in that step or not, I would encourage you, the reason that we stand up here and I stand up here as your pastor and say I don't have it all together, I just literally, I wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. You tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm on this ark. I'm floating on this boat and you're the one showing me where to go. I don't even have a rudder to make it go. I'm literally floating and I'm trusting you. And so my question is, in this thing called baptism, have you been hung up because you think standing out for baptism is real weird? Have you been hung up from being a part of the church and being all that God created you to be because you don't understand what baptism is? Really, let me ask you this. Have you been stuck not believing because you don't know what real life is? You see, John 3, 16 and 17 tells us, and it's a verse we know so well, Jesus literally, it says this in 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world, he gave, 
his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So when we believe in him, we're no longer immersed or baptized in death. We are now baptized and immersed in life. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world would be saved, but to save the world through him. That through him the world would be saved. Maybe today you say, I want to believe, but those Christians are weird. They stand out. They have hope when they shouldn't deserve hope. They have They have life in the midst of death or the craziest circumstance. I don't know what they're immersed in or what they have on, but I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid and I'm not drinking the juice. But I just want to ask you for real, do you have life? Do you have this life? Have you been baptized in Christ Jesus? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? Because here's the thing, I can baptize you 50 times today and it won't get you any closer to heaven. You can give to your blue in the face. You can memorize, you can literally memorize this book time and time again. Every first five chapters of this book, you can know the law inside and out. You can check all the boxes of trying to follow all the rules, but you're no better than the Jews when they stood there and had to have repentance. When they came to John the Baptist, they had to understand my religion is not good enough. It will never save me. I can never be good enough. So even though I've gone through a ritual act of baptism, I've not truly been baptized. So they repented and turned from their old life and stepped into their new life and said, how do I do that? Well, you've got to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Believe that God loved you enough that he made a way for you to have life. And then, can you truly go through the act and the practice of baptism? So today, we do this every week, guys, whether you're watching online or in this house, so that you can see Jesus is who he says he is so that you can trust him as your Lord and Savior. You may be stuck in saying, I don't believe everything about the Bible. Well, what happens if I don't agree about tithing, if I don't agree with what it says in this and that? And I just want to ask you today, if you don't have life, will you put your faith in the hands of Jesus to trust him enough to know he'll work that out and he'll reveal it to you in his time? Because I'm willing to bet right now your way seems pretty empty because I've been there. I know. So today, if you would like to put your faith in Jesus, if you would truly like to be baptized in Jesus first before you take that step of baptism, I just wanna offer you a way to do that. Right now, we do this every week as a family. We pray this prayer out loud for the benefit of those who are coming to faith for the first time because we don't believe in doing life alone here. We walk with you step by step everywhere you go and, and because we believe Jesus does that with us. So today, people are gonna be praying with you, but it's not the words of this prayer, it's not the act of this prayer, it's the faith in this prayer that makes you saved. So with every head bow and every eye closed, this is the opportunity for you. We're about to pray this prayer out loud. I'm gonna ask you to pray along with us. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe you lived the life I couldn't live, (laughs) died the death I deserved on the cross, but love me enough not to stay dead, but rose again on the third day so that I may have life. Come take over my life, Lord. Baptize me in your spirit. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. And with every head bow and every eye closed, whether you're watching online or in this house, I'm gonna count to three and you're gonna have the opportunity to respond if for the first time you can say with faith, Jesus is who he says he is and you have received the gift of salvation and you trust that he is your Lord and Savior. One, two, three. If that's you in this house or online, this is your opportunity to respond. You're going to see a hand raise up. If, if you're listening on a podcast, if you're, if you're watching on, on YouTube, you can comment or you can email us at prayer at divine.tv or, or give us a call at 864-580-6698. We have people who want to celebrate you, people who want to walk with you through your season, people who want to walk with you through that question, I want to believe, but people who are baptized in the Spirit people who are baptized in Christ Jesus, people who know what it's like to be exactly where you are. If that's you today, this is your opportunity to respond. 
And for everyone else in the house, with every head bowed and every eye closed, when I get through praying, we're about to sing a song. I'm just gonna ask that Jesus remind us what baptism really is in our life, that we can see him in a new way, in a fresh way, and that we would trust that he is who he says he is. So dear Jesus, I'm asking that you would just be with us today, that you would just remind us who you are, that you would show us who you are, that we would just be baptized so immersed in you, so completely immersed in you that we can't help but follow you, that we can't help but see you in a new way, that, that Jesus, we're not afraid to stand up and say, Jesus, I'm all yours. And when the world comes at us this week and the waters seem like they're flooding us and, the, and we see it seems like the world around us is drowning, Jesus, remind us that we get to be on the ark. We get to be a part of salvation because of you. And all we have to do is point others to you because you are the lifeline. When the folks are in the water, our loved ones are in the water, and they're overwhelmed by everything in their life, and they're saying, I want to believe God, but Jesus, help us point them to you because we're so consumed by you. We're so immersed in you. We're so baptized by you. Jesus, give us eyes to see you in a new way right now. As we worship in this moment, remind us what it was like to be in those flood waters and remind us what it was like to be saved by you. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please.
Hopefully today uh, you learned something new about baptism. Maybe you didn't know that. But the thing that, that I want us to be able to do is to live a life baptized. You know, we, we look back at Noah and the ark and we can see Jesus all over. We look at John the Baptist and we see Jesus all over and how we're washed in living waters. And then we get to live a life with Jesus all over us. You know, the reason I wanted to share with you that from 1 Peter 3 today for real as we cranked up this new series, how we get to stand out to the world around us is we get to give them a reason for our hope. I know that we can be in the craziest of circumstances, but we have a reason to have hope. And how we get to stand out in this world is point people to Jesus. And no matter who we come in contact with today, I guarantee you somewhere in their life, they're saying, I wanna believe, but. And Jesus has placed them in your path to show him to them so that you can point them to him so that you can say, hey, this is a reason for my hope. I've had some crazy stuff happen in my life. I've had some crazy stuff happen that, that to me too. And, and I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I know how you feel. I know what it feels like to be drowning. I know what it feels like to be hopeless. I know what it feels like to be in need of salvation. And you can point them to him and you just let him take over. And I promise you, you'll be a part of a conversation you would have never thought could ever happen. So as we get ready to lock, lock it up and pray today, that's exactly what I'm gonna pray over us this week is that we stand out and being able to give a hope, the reason for our hope, but also that we just be baptized. So with uh, as we get, you see people locking up hands and high fives and arms and all that good stuff as we get ready to pray, that's exactly what I'm gonna pray over us today. So dear Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for allowing us just to be fully immersed by you. We're no longer defined by our sin. We're no longer defined by our past. We're no longer defined by the flood. We're defined by our salvation and that is you. So Jesus, as we go out into this world and we even address the areas of our life where we say, I wanna believe, but Jesus, let us point to you in everything that we do. Let us stand out and not be afraid of it because when we're immersed by you, we can't help but stand out. So Jesus, I pray that as we go out throughout this week, that folks would see our baptism by you. That folks would just, when we walk in a room, Jesus, they would just see you. When, when, when we're in the midst of a crazy circumstance that others would just see you. And Jesus, I pray that you would just ignite in us the boldness to follow you wherever you call us to go. That we wouldn't be afraid to grow in you. That we wouldn't be afraid to be exactly who you created us to be. That we would stop living in fear of, of what others think or stop living in worry because we're so trying so hard to get it right. That we would just be in full surrender and full baptism and full immersion of you. That we would just be who you created us to be. So Jesus, I pray that we would stand out. We love you, Lord. We can't believe we get to do this and we can't thank you enough for coming to this earth, living a life we couldn't live, dying the death that we deserve, but allowing us to be heaven on earth now. It's in your wonderful and precious name we pray, amen. And for everyone else, if you've never truly been baptized or you have questions about baptism, we have an opportunity for you to do that today or you can reach out to us and we would love to talk with you about that. Have an awesome week. Can't wait to continue uh, next week. I want to believe, but, and take an offering for the Carolina Pregnancy Center. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. See you next week.